Hello everyone and welcome to Expo North Fearless Business Week and what a great title that is. So this is a fantastic opportunity for creative, culture, heritage, tourism and related sectors to meet with a whole range of real experts here and ask some of those complex, difficult questions and you're going to get some really targeted and helpful information and answers. So I'm sure you'll find this really useful and enjoy the sessions. Hi everyone, welcome to another event for Fearless Business Week. Today we have Gavin Maxwell here. Hi Gavin. Hi. Gavin is a relationship manager at Royal Bank of Scotland. Gavin, total honest, like I love Royal Bank of Scotland, they're my bank, so it's very nice to be able to chat with you. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what a relationship manager is and who you are and what you do? Yeah, so I'm Gavin Maxwell. I'm a business relationship manager for the Royal Bank of Scotland. I um, worked for the bank for just under 11 years now and I've worked in the, the business banking team for the last seven years. Um, so within my current role, um, I have a portfolio of around about 150 customers um, covering Inverness and um, also Lewis and Harris. Um, and prior to lockdown um, and the kind of COVID-19 restrictions, I would uh, I'd meet with um, my customers on a regular basis, um, on a face-to-face, well, face -face, um, really just to find out what their, their plans and goals are um, over the next sort of 12 months or so. Um, I'm part of a team of 12 managers covering the whole of the islands. Um, and I think in 2019, um, between the team, we lent over 20 million pounds of, of new business and um, few business customers. So that's a bit about me. So for you, why banking? Um, my dad was in the bank as well. Uh, so he was in the bank for 32 years. Um, and when I left school initially, um, he'd asked if I, if I fancy just working over the, the summer holidays. <laughs> and I'm still here 11 years later. So um, so you must like it. Yeah, yeah. I enjoy, enjoy um, dealing with the customers on a daily basis. Um, also enjoy working with um, with the team of colleagues that I work with on a, on a day-to-day -day basis. So, no, I enjoy it. That's great. And I really appreciate you being here for Fearless Business Week, where we're trying to ask questions that we might be a little too afraid to ask. So we, we do have a list of questions that you have sent in, and yep. we'll, we'll dive into that. But first, I want to kind of talk about some themes, especially kind of orienting ourselves between the relationship between the creative industries and banks, it's not one as a filmmaker, I would genuinely make the leap for. So when I'm raising money for films, I don't necessarily think Royal Bank of Scotland, because I guess I have a, I have a bias that banks might try to avoid risk. And with a lot of the creative industries, there is risk. So I know that you have actually a particular interest in the creative industries I have heard. So can you tell us a little bit about first about you and your interest in the creative industries in your area? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've probably got a particular interest in, uh, in music. And again, kind of prior to lockdown, I'd regularly attend uh, gigs at the likes of the Ironworks and Inverness, awesome. uh, go to Belgium Music Festival, uh, that type of thing. And also um, attend the you know, performance at the likes of Eden Court. Um, the, again, craft shows at Eden Court as well. And my partner's also a, a fairly keen photographer. So, um, probably don't, I'm not an expert in, in all the different industries within the sector, but, um, but do have a, have a keen interest. Are some of your clients in the creative industries? Yeah, there is. There's a, there's a good mix. So um, some that I deal with on a, on a regular basis, architects, um, filmmakers, uh -huh. and some within the, the kind of cultural education sector as well. And so they're the the ones that kind of spring to mind that I deal with on a, on a fairly regular basis and have a good relationship with as well. And so they're some of the ones that I would like to catch up with. I do catch up with on a, on a very regular basis. So um, within the current role, maybe before COVID, it would maybe be on a maybe six monthly basis, um, whether that's a phone call or a face-to-face -face meeting, um, again, just to see um, what the business's plans are for the future and if we can look to assist there, then that's great. That's great. And I'm really curious about this idea of a relationship manager because um, our local branch unfortunately closed. So a lot yeah. of my interaction with um, the bank is digital. 
-hmm. And whereas before it's a notable difference because the people that I was interacting with, I've known for a decade. Yeah. I mean, they, they probably know too much about me and, and there would always be really good chat. And so there was there for me, it really did feel like there's a relationship there. Can you tell us a little bit about in the kind of digital age of banking, what that means to be a relationship manager? Uh, yeah, well, I think even more so um, recently with the fact that I'm currently working from home um, and have been since March, which is the same as probably a lot of people. And um, everything has kind of moved towards the, the likes of Zoom. And um, so we're, we're being encouraged to undertake as many meetings as possible now um, through Zoom. Um, and that's internal meetings as well. And um, there's also kind of a, a push towards people using digital banking, I suppose, in, in remote locations. It, it works very well, saves you having to travel. Um, but there are still also the other officer kind of service options out there um, in the rural communities, the likes of the mobile bank. Um, and you can also bank now in the local post offices as well. And um, so there are options there, um, a mix of kind of um, new technology and, and existing services that are available. So for, for you though, in terms of building relationships, how does one do that in a digital age? Um, well, it's, it's probably a mix of um, what would be face-to-face meetings, now Zoom meetings. So trying to undertake those as, as regularly as possible with my portfolio of customers is, is key to kind of building that relationship. Um, and then when I am meeting with the customers through Zoom, um, we're undertaking what's called a financial health check regularly. So that's um, just undertaking a review of um, the businesses, the business business owners' finances, okay. um, looking for for ways to help them better or potentially to save them money. And um, if they're looking to invest, um, then that's something that we're we're obviously keen to explore as well. Is that what a relationship manager does? Because I'm t- I don't have one, so I would. Uh, so, what kind of services do you offer people? Yeah, that's, that's exactly what we offer. So it's, it's finding out a bit about the business um, at the outset and um, looking at, at potential funding options that um, the businesses may be looking to explore. So if that's building, uh, not building, but buying premises, um, whether it's investing in new vehicles and that type of thing. We would also look at savings options as well. Um, and then there's other products and services um, that we, we can offer to so the likes of um, business insurance, and um, card merchant services. Okay. Um, there's also other products available, the likes of um, Free Agent, which is an accounting software package that the Royal Bank offers to its customers free of charge. Um, so it's just running through all these, these different service options, really, um, and just making sure that the, that the customers are making best use of them. That's so great. Is part as part of as part of that advice also how to negotiate through COVID and kind of has COVID changed a lot of those service offerings? Uh, yeah, um, it's probably just changed the way we operate more than anything. I mean, at the, at the start of of lockdown, we were extremely busy. Probably, well, I was certainly busier than I'd ever been before. And um, just with that, a lot of customers trying to get in touch, looking to put. Um, potential additional kind of cash flow measures in place. And so the, at the outset, the bank was fairly quick in putting a, a lot of additional kind of cash flow measures in place. So it's, it's been a case of kind of learning a lot. <laughs> and then as things have developed over the last um, the last six months or so, looking at the, the government funding options as well. Mm-hmm. And so we've been able to explore those with customers. So, I mean, it, it always works best if the customers can come to us at the outset, if they know that they're going to have uh, cash flow issues at an early stage, to make us aware of them and we can then present options that, that need to support great. I mean, your, your Twitter page is a wealth of information. Um, and one of them was, I saw you retweeted something about kind of what to do when furlough ends for employers. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it sounds like having a relationship manager is a really important thing to navigate these choppy waters that we're all yeah. facing. Yeah, a lot of the time it's probably just trying to point customers in the right direction. I mean, a lot of the time we can't give advice, but we can we can try and try and help where possible. And um, so even if it's not a bank product, it's maybe just uh, trying to point them in the right direction. 
That's great. So, okay, we, we work with a whole host of creative industries. We work with people who are in the crafts. As you said, you're a music fan, so a lot of bands. Yeah. It's pretty much one commonality between all of them is the gig economy. Okay. So we're, you know, we don't have a steady income. We have a gig economy where we go from gig to gig to gig. And mm -hmm. if we're lucky, that is steady. And some people actually who are changing to kind of a digital platform may have more of a predictable income, especially if they're selling something. Yeah. I guess just to start off easy as we go into the fearless questions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> lucky you, Gavin. Um, <laughs> It would never occur to me, and I know probably to a lot of my clients, that they can go to the bank for financial support um, because that they're artists or because that they belong to the gig economy. Mm -hmm. Is that assumption true or because you work? No, you're shaking your head. No, no, definitely not. Um, we would look, as, as we, we always try to do with any type of business, we would look at each individual business in their own right. Um, so, so that would be, I suppose, if, if you were looking for funding um, and you were, you were a musician, um, for example, then it, it would be looking at how, how your business has performed over a, over a period of time. Um, but we would also need to take into account how the business will be affected given the current climate and how you expect things to progress, hopefully after COVID comes to an end. And um, so, yeah, we would certainly, we'd certainly be open to, to having a discussion anyway. God, that's, re that's really good to know. I want to underline that for everybody who <laughs> is kind of looking to develop their business a bit more um, or their creative industry. So you do see the creative industry as an industry. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, and when you said you would look at the kind of the history of their income over a period of time, is there, if, you know, I'm a let's say I'm a new filmmaker and I've only had my business for about a year, is there an acceptable period of time that I should wait before going to a bank? No, there isn't. Um, ideally, if we could have a, a year's history, then great. But if you are effectively starting up in business, um, then we, we can look to assist it as well. So we would then look for projections okay. um, of how you feel the business would perform for at least the first couple of years. Else. Okay. And because um, I have a great imagination, those projections, how do you assess risk really? I mean, do you look at analogous companies? Do you look at my assets? How does that work? It probably depends on the amount that you'd be looking for. Um, but we are looking at the full picture all the time. Um, so we would, if, if you were a startup business, we would be looking for a business plan um, and a, a CV from you and just to, to gain an understanding of the experience that you have within the sector and the likelihood of you being a success, I suppose, moving forward. Okay. We would like that in with the projections that you provided. And we'd be looking for what's called assumptions alongside your projections. So that's just to give us, um, or for us to gain an understanding of how you've managed to calculate the figures. Okay. So if you're, I don't know, if you, if you had a, an income one month that was, that was very high, we need to understand um, how, how you've come to that figure. Okay. And then I suppose it's then just having a realistic look at it and deciding whether we feel that that would be achievable. Okay. And the other things that we would potentially look for if you were looking for funding would be personal bank statements and business bank statements if you've already started trading, just to see kind of your track record and to ensure that you've, you've no issues in the background there. Okay. So it's just assessing the full picture really. And before making a final decision. So if I, I can, I can imagine that if I had some kind of um, product I'm selling or a steady business, like if I was a knitter and I wanted to start an online shop or yep. if I were a theater company mm -hmm. or a band or a filmmaker who wanted to put on an event, um, is it better to say I'm putting on a series of events? And so over time, you can see that there'll be a projection of income or can we go to the bank for like a one-off like i want to put on the best concert of all time and it's going to be or a festival how did mm -hmm. how does that work that would probably make things a little bit more tricky and um, if it was just one single event but again if, if you could show the kind of profitability of the one event that you were running um, mm -hmm. and the funds were only required for a shorter period of time to cover 
um, then again, it's something we can certainly look at. Okay. And I'm sorry, these are so basic questions, but I'm a bit of a basic person. Um, what happens if I convince you that investing in my theater production is going to make a huge amount of money and yep. then COVID hits? And not only do we not make that money, but for unforeseen circumstances, I can't pay you back. Um, and we didn't make that money. What, what happens? Um, so to, to start off, with it, we'd probably just be keeping in close with your, your relationship manager if you had one. Um, just to explain the, the current position. Um, as I kind of touched on earlier, there are kind of additional funding options available um, if you were really struggling in the short term. So the, the likes of the bounce back loan scheme that you probably heard of a lot about um, recently um, and the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme as well, they would offer a little bit of additional assistance maybe until things picked up. Um, if not, and you were really struggling to pay, then the bank does have an area within um, within the organisation that we kind of assist and, and speak to the customers on a more regular basis to try and steer them through a difficult patch. Okay. Um, so there, there, there's options there. There's options there. That's also very good to know. That's good to know. So has, um, for before we dive into my slightly scary book of fearless questions, okay. um, we haven't gotten there yet. Um, <laughs> would, um, what are the bank's attitude now that we're dealing with a global pandemic. Do you feel that actually taking more risk is something that the bank is looking to do to kind of grow the economy? Are they being very conservative? I think it's probably a, a little bit more of a cautious approach um, at the minute, just because there's so much uncertainty there. Um, but we will, we are still open for business. Okay. Um, so if, I mean, we'll, Kind of assess any application fully um, and then make a decision from there but we are still definitely open for business here. I mean you have an interesting perspective because you have such a diverse portfolio so do you see that even during corona there's any places areas of growth? Yeah of course there's um uh, well it, it varies but there, there's always people that are going to benefit and um, businesses that have been able to continue to trade over the period of time so I mean your obvious one would be the shops um, yeah um, they're selling food <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's I mean. yeah yeah um, i mean a basic a basic example but they've been they've been allowed to continue to trade throughout the pandemic and uh, and people have probably been using them a bit more than normal so uh, so yeah there's there's definitely businesses that will benefit but there's there's some that will struggle as well and um, i mean i've a lot of dealings with, with businesses in the hospitality sector. Yeah. And uh, with the kind of three month lockdown at the beginning of the um, of the season effectively, yeah. that's, that's really hampered trade this year. Um, so it's, it's been trying to support those businesses as well as trying to support the ones that are looking to grow at the same time. And are, are you guys optimistic that after we get a handle on the global pandemic, then it's going to be business as usual? So you're kind of floating those harder yes. businesses? Yeah, I think again, it's it's probably going to be different for for a lot of different businesses in, in different sectors. And you'd like to think, again, we talked about the hospitality sector there. They, they you think a lot of these businesses will bounce back fairly quickly. I think a lot of people will be desperate for a holiday um, when everything comes to an end. So, um, so, so some businesses like that, I'd imagine, will bounce back fairly quickly. There's others if there's maybe not as much expendable cash about. That might take a little bit longer to recover, but hopefully. Yeah. And and in terms of the, I don't know how much you can tell me, but in terms of the internal thinking at the Royal Bank of Scotland, has a global pandemic irrevocably changed some policies? Are they now thinking of doing some preventative in case this happens again? Um, I don't think so, so much on that front. Again, it's probably just a little bit more um, cautious. So, I mean, the likes of our lending policy, the loan to values have reduced slightly, the maximum loan to values that we can look to offer, mm -hmm. um, and the terms have reduced slightly. Um, but in the main, everything's remained as is for now. And that's probably about all I can, I can really say at the minute. That's all I know. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So are you ready for some of the audience's fearless questions? Yes. <laughs> Taking a drink of water. Okay. <laughs> um, so 
how micro economy can you go with artists? So when you look at people's um, profit or yeah. profitability, let's say I make candles and I make a two pound profit on every candle I sell, is that enough for you guys uh, to consider investing in me? Or are you looking for a little bit bigger profit margins? No, we would we'd be interested or we can look to take on any type of business. And dependent on your the amount that the business would turn over depends on kind of what sector within the bank you would fit within. Okay. And so if it's if it's a small business turning over anything up to what we class is would be about up to five hundred thousand pounds. And then you would sit within the business one connect team. And my portfolio of customers tend to range from five hundred thousand pounds worth of turnover up to two million. Um, and anything above that sits within the commercial line. Okay, that's interesting. So that's also linked into the level of debt that some businesses have. Mm -hmm. um, so anything up to fifty thousand pounds will sit within the, the business one connect team. Okay. And um, that's a, a a team of managers based in Edinburgh who would manage your business. And um, again, if, it, if it's debt levels we're looking at, I'm looking anywhere between fifty thousand and usually five hundred thousand pounds um, is the bracket that I sit within. And again, anything above that, the 500,000 threshold sits with the commercial line. Okay, that's really good to know. And, you know, when you're talking about writing a business plan before you maybe approach a relationship manager um, and communicating what your business does and how much money you make, and I'm wondering if sometimes there's not a semantics or a language issue. And one of our clients is wondering as well in terms of the way artists describe their business and is there any advice you can give to folks about when they are looking to approach a bank, if there's yeah. some areas or keywords that we should be keeping in mind? I mean, I wouldn't say so, no. Um, I think it's always good if, if you're not experienced in writing a business plan um, or projections, you can always get assistance from the likes of the Business Gateway who offer free advice okay. and help, um, or you could pay the likes of a local accountant. To, yeah. to help you write the business plan or to certainly have a look over it for you just to, to give you some pointers and that's always a good thing to do if you're not that familiar with um, with undertaking a business plan or projections. Yeah okay that's really that's good to know and we talked a little bit about how at least my local um, RBS unfortunately has moved um, and I actually don't know if the van I haven't seen the van in ages I'm not sure okay. it's functioning still in the area so I have to go quite a far away um, okay but uh, you know, one of one of the audience wants to know about your commitment to local regions and maybe some accessibility and because you are the Royal Bank of Scotland and then I think you're also NatWest now. So we're just just curious about, um, I guess, your, yeah, your commitment to local regions. Yeah, um, I mean, I can only kind of talk about the north of Scotland. I'm not that familiar with the rest, yeah. the rest of Scotland, but there are still a number of branches in, throughout the north of Scotland. In, I think, as I said at the, at the outset, I initially started working in the bank up in Illico. Um, so I understand the importance of the, the kind of local branch to kind of smaller communities. Um, so I think kind of what I said earlier is I mean, where the decision has been taken to close a local branch, we've always tried to ensure that there's alternative banking arrangements in place. So whether that be in the local post office or as you, you kind of mentioned, using the, the local um, mobile van, um, a lot of the, the timetables kind of have been restructured to try and suit as many of the, the kind of rural locations um, where possible. Um, so I think that's probably the bank's coming moving forward. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you, Kevin. That sounds good. And some really practical questions. So how easy is it for a new business, especially in a remote area, let's say to open a bank account? Um, let's say they get a grant. They don't have a bank account yet. They need yeah. a but it, how, how easy is it, especially during COVID? Okay. Um, again, I can only speak from the Royal Bank's perspective, but um, there's kind of a self-service portal that you can, you can start an application online. Okay. Um, that would then be picked up by, it's a dedicated account opening team within the Royal Bank um, who would review the application that's being completed and then they would get back in touch with the customer if they needed some additional information from there. And then there would, there would be kind of regular updates on, on the account opening process and then the account details would then be sent through when the account's been opened. Okay, that's great. And 
How about some COVID relief fine print? Okay. Information from the bank. Yeah. Um, and is there anything in particular that you'd, you'd like any sort of guidance on? Yeah, so um, not only are you seeing, oh, how does it affect loans if you were to take a COVID relief from the government? So that's number one. And, okay. and then number two, because um, I, I know personally when we were looking for a mortgage, um, we didn't realize that taking COVID relief money actually affects our viability for a mortgage, we were told. Right, okay. Um, so it's just some COVID relief first fine print from... Mm -hmm. So are you meaning if you, if you were to take the likes of, a, for example, a bounce back loan? Yeah. And then you were to approach the bank, yes. say, looking to, to purchase a property at a later date. Yes. Uh, we would have to factor in the repayments of the bounce back loan over the as they stand the remaining five years or if that's to be extended up to the nine years and then yeah the repayments on that bounce back will have to be factored in when we're calculating serviceability I suppose and um, for any kind of further borrowing requirements in the future. Okay and I, I know you um, talked about the hospitality industry are there what kind of initiatives are in place for I, COVID relief within the bank itself when you see that businesses are struggling. Yeah. And so initially, um, we offered short term increases to, to overdraft facilities. And now this was prior to the likes of the bounce back loan or the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme uh, being announced. Um, the other thing that we offered at the outset was um, six month capital repayment holidays on business loans. Oh, wow. Okay. And um, so since then the bounce back loan schemes obviously come out, which a lot of customers have taken advantage of, um, and also the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme for amounts over fifty thousand um, pounds. We've also gone back out to the customers that we've that we've provided capital repayment holidays to um, to offer the chance for them to apply for an extension for a further six months if mm -hmm. they feel that would be beneficial for the business. So they'll continue to pay interest over that period of time, but they won't be making the capital repayments. Okay, that's great. And interest rates are quite low right now. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, why is that? <laughs> um, I suppose it's just that the economy is is kind of struggling. So it's. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the it's, it's the way of the west, the way of the world yeah, yeah, at the moment. For, for a period of time now, yeah, base rates are kind of an all time low of point one. Um, Do you know? Um, my dad explained to me, and please tell me if this is a correct way to look at it, um, that banks in a way are like any other shop, but they're, what their product is money. So they need to calculate the difference between what they've gotten the money for and what they're loaning it out for. Would you say that's like a very basic? That's a very, a very basic, yeah. I mean, I'm probably not the right person to ask you about it. <laughs> um, I might go into it in any sort of great detail, but, but yeah. But yeah, pretty much. So you mentioned a word overdraft and I'm sorry that we're getting into the weeds here, but another okay. question we had was how can you negotiate you re or renegotiate your overdraft? I think that's an important question for a lot of people at the moment who maybe aren't having the same kind of income. Right, okay. Um, so again, it would just be making contact with your, with your contact within the bank um, and then Kind of explaining your current position, okay, um, and and I suppose detailing what sort of facility you would require moving forward. Okay. Then your your representative in the bank would we just try to find out again a, a bit more about the business, what your plans are moving forward, how you feel longer term the business will recover. Okay. Um, and also again just taking into account the kind of um, the history and how the business has performed up until now, um, and then we. You can kind of review your options from there. Okay, that sounds great. And bef before you mentioned too, I just wanted to clarify the idea of assessment of risk yep. when you're looking at a business um, and the word assets, because mm -hmm. assets come up a lot. And I know a lot of the clients I work with, including me, don't have a lot of assets. So yeah. they might have rental accommodation, maybe mm -hmm. they have some equipment for the business. Can you list out what would is that a disadvantage? Should we get some assets? And what is considered 
assets? Not, ne- not necessarily. I mean, um, I think, well, well, I mean, we wouldn't necessarily be looking to take security over um, an asset. Okay. If we were looking at an overdraft facility, we tend to be able to look at, at um, borrowing facilities of up to £50,000 okay. um, where we wouldn't need to take security over an asset. Anything above that, we would maybe look at taking security over the likes of a building. Okay. Um, I mean, it, it then depends on the, the type of entity. So if it's a sole trader or a, or a partnership, the owner of the business is kind of fully liable for the debt anyways. And if, say, you're, you're a limited company and you were looking for a £20,000 overdraft facility, mm-hmm. we would look for personal guarantees to be pledged by the debtors. Okay. Um, and the other, the other thing I was wondering too, if it, let's say I was a textile artist and I was coming to you and I was really looking to set up my business or grow my business and I found one investor and the investor can't put as much money to cover the whole thing into it. So okay. I was looking for a bank to fill that gap. Yeah. Does it make me a better possible investment opportunity that I already have some funds coming in? Yeah. Um, I mean, we would look at that positively that someone else is willing to come back, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. Um, the other thing we would take into account is what the payment strategy would be with the third party that was looking to, to assist. Okay. Um, so we'd have to factor that in when we're, we're calculating the business's ability to pay the debt. Um, okay. But yeah, it, it certainly would look on way. And I know that's an old fashioned example because a lot of people are going online now for crowdfunding. Do yeah. you consider crowdfunding an equally good um, sign that people want to invest in the business? Yeah, yeah. We, again, we can, we can look at an element of that. Um, so it would probably, again, just be finding out exactly what the terms and conditions are of, of the crowdfunding. Okay. And factoring that in when we, when we undertake an assessment, I suppose. Um, but yeah, we, we, okay. look at, we have to look at it. Kevin, you're doing very well. There are only a couple more fearless questions for you. Um, <laughs> um, so is there, someone wants to know, is there an unconscious bias, do you feel, um, that banks might have between the different disciplines in the arts? So does a craft maker look like a better investment than a musician, or does a festival look like a better investment than a film? No. Um, no I mean, every application or businesses looked at individually and okay. um, so th- there wouldn't be any kind of comparisons in within the sector and um, we would look at each each application on its own merit and make a decision from there okay and fi- thank you so much and finally is there because the I feel like we're bridging a gap here. I feel like there's sometimes a disconnect between the creative industries and, and banks because, you know, we look for grants, we look for crowdfunding, but I have never approached RBS to fund a film. So I feel like we're, we're doing, we're reaching our hands across the divide, Kevin, okay. which is very good. Yeah. Um, is that disconnect mutual? So do you feel like on the bank's end, is there a lot of discussion about how to serve the needs of the creative industries and maybe the specific needs of that area and that industry? Um, I don't know if there's discussions about that sector in particular, um, but as a whole, we certainly, from the customers I speak to, I don't feel that there's a disconnect. Okay. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that um, within the creative industry, the businesses that I deal with, I feel have a have a pretty decent relationship with with the bank in general. And um, so no, I wouldn't I wouldn't say so. That's really good. And the same question goes for region. So do you feel in terms of being in the Highlands and Islands area, is there um, sensitivity to regional needs? Um. Yes, I suppose there is to to a certain extent. I, I think. Probably within the, the Northern Highlands region, as I mentioned earlier, there, there is a lot of businesses within the hospitality sector, um, okay. which we tend to deal with that, that maybe isn't the case, maybe in the central belt. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I suppose it's, you're dealing with different customers, aren't you? It's a different yeah. customer base. Exactly. And so last, I know that you don't have a crystal ball. No one can see into the future. Um, yeah. 
And if you look at the newspapers at the moment, it looks like we're headed into a bit of a bleak winter. Yeah. The kind of Game of Thrones winter is coming. Um, <laughs> so if you're if you're a business that's relied on a scheme thus far, mm -hmm. um, what happens if you don't get to open in the projected time? It's, pro it's probably a difficult one for me to answer at the minute. Mm -hmm. um, we probably just need to, need to wait and see what's what's going to happen <laughs> moving forward. I would imagine that if there's a lot of businesses that aren't able to open, the, the government will announce more more help. I hope, anyways. <laughs> um, and it's again from a banking perspective, it'll just be a case that we'll need to continue to keep in touch with our customers as often as we possibly can, and um, just so that we can try and predict any problems as early as possible. Okay. And that sounds so good. And before we go, an easy question yeah. for you. We always end <laughs> with a bit of advice. So advice that you have been given along the way, something a parent's told you, but, but for your career that you found really helpful. Um, Maybe that's the hardest question I've asked. Yeah, I think it's definitely the hardest question. And um, I don't know, I, I always say, um, feel that it's, it's important to important to have a, a I suppose a, a kind of plan in place and um, so whether that's as a business owner and um, if you've got kind of regular goals that you're looking to achieve it's probably always good to have something to aim towards um, and that tends to keep you motivated. That's really good but, advice because I can tell your brain is far more organized than mine. I don't have like a list of things I want to achieve today let alone with my business so that's a good very good advice. Um, Gavin, thank you very, people who have you as a relationship manager are very lucky and thank you very much for joining us today for Fearless Business Week. No problem. Thanks for having me. Take care. Cheers.